What's up, everyone? Thralls Mena here once again. I'm the Crock Neck. Rin, Jam and John. And I am, of course, Bob Lovitz. I mean, Shredlord. And we're back with a discography ranking. Figure we'd kick off the new year with uh, one we've been tabling for a while, and it's a doozy. It is Entombed and Entombed AD. We figure we'd include their three albums since they were kind of the only version of Entombed that was actually putting out albums and touring at this point. But this has been a long time like favorite band of mine. Namely, they got me into a whole other subset of death metal and what are you guys' experience here with the, the Entombed guys? Discovered Entombed later on in life. However, there's three syllables that I say when I think of this band, HM2. And that is a predominant sound that you're gonna hear all over this. It started a whole genre of buzz and chainsaws and love it. we're here for it. I also found Entombed later in life, in fact, much later. In fact, outside of Left Hand Path, I don't know that I ever really jammed Entombed until ranking this. So, I mean, yeah, that's where I'm at. You crazy bastard. No, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm almost in the There's same a lot of shit, you know? I oh, mean, yeah. you're, you're going to miss some of it, unless you're Nick. You're going to miss some of it along the way. And Entombed was just one of those things that I heard in passing and was like, eh. I saw the video for Wolverine Blues on Headbangers Ball and... 93 or whenever that album came out, 92? 93. 93. 93. Okay, God. About 23 years old. Yeah. Bought it on cassette tape and then uh, never really listened to them ever again for some reason. But here we are, listening to it all. Yeah. So, a little backstory about Entombed. Before they were Entombed, they technically formed in 1987 in Stockholm, Sweden as Brainwarp, and then quickly changed the name to Nihilist. Now, Nihilist consisted of guitarists Uffe or Ulf Sederlund. It's... I find both names, so he's either Uffe or Ulf. Alex Hedlund, drummer Nick Anderson, what a name, it's a great name, really. <laughs> it's <laughs> tremendous it's, name. It's one of the best names. It's all right. Bassist Johnny Hedlund and vocalist Lars Goran Petrov, affectionately known as LG Petrov. Now, this band pretty much generated a nice underground buzz. They put out some demos and it kind of started the whole death metal movement in Stockholm. Now. The relationship of the band was kind of strenuous, namely between Johnny Hedlund and everyone else in the band. So, what the band did was essentially break up Nihilist and then reform with everyone but Johnny and remained Nihilist. So, yeah, um, kind of a tenuous breakup there, but they didn't really keep Nihilist for very long. In fact, they changed their name to Entombed not long after. And in 1989, they recorded their But Life Goes On demo, and not long after that, they were picked up by Earache Records to put out their debut album. So they went to Sunlight Studios to work with one Thomas Skogsberg, which, if you're into Swedish death metal, he's a pretty famous name because there's a lot of bands that went to him and his studio to get this ultra gnarly sound. And on June 6th, 1990, they released their debut album, Left Hand Path. To literally the surprise of no one that watches this channel, this is my number one album. <laughs> Most telegraphed punch I think I've ever delivered. I might have just emailed you that I was going to punch you six months ago, and you had all this time to prepare for it. This is one of my favorite death metal albums of all time. The title track, that whole bridge where they do the score to Phantasm is fucking brilliant, but Dude, like literally every track in here, and I'm gonna name a couple before these guys get a chance to. Revel in Flesh, Bitter Loss, But Life Goes On. Yeah, I made it on there too. And Drowned. This album is a fucking classic. It is essentially leprosy for the Stockholm scene. Whereas leprosy kind of took off everything in Tampa, this is that album for Stockholm. What y'all think? I'm but that life, Jerry. I'm all but that life. <laughs> uh, this is my number one as well. This is a milestone metal album without question for a couple different reasons. It basically kicked off the, the Swedish death metal sound for the most part. There are others that would come along and do it, but they're one of the forefathers. The tone, the mm -hmm. tone alone on this mm -hmm. album was so influential to so many different metal bands yeah. that everything about this album from the sound of it to the riffs and the creativity behind them is just super influential and for a debut album it's hard to kick ass on a debut album like this uh, morbid angel does it though right john <laughs> <laughs> and subtle barb I, I, you'll live it down one of these i days. think this but, is a gem of the entire metal spectrum 
obviously, these two guys hate this album. Uh, I don't know why, because it's such a great album. I just don't understand why it's not your favorite. That's yeah, certainly not number Both six. Definitely not number six. Jesus though. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> To, I guess piggyback off what these guys said. This is a a monumental album in time. You hear the sound of this album in so many bands today. You know, I, I think everybody does their best to pay homage to a real trendsetter for uh, this genre of metal. Of course, Revel in Flesh, but life goes on. Bitter loss, uh, morbid devourment. Ugh. It just has a lot of heft in this album, and and like Shred said, the tone is killer. I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer when it came to ranking this discography that this was number one. So. Yeah. Think about how many bands are actually named after tracks on this album. Yeah, well, that too. Yep. Yep. Number one. What are you going to do? It's the cornerstone of the Florida death metal scene. <laughs> oh, what? Right. Yes. Often duplicated. All of it. Always Good. replicated. Good. Like, Phantasm 19. How many sequels they have? It's not 19. <laughs> Five, six, six. I don't shit. I don't even know anymore. So, needless to say, this debut uh, kind of became pretty legendary pretty quick. They played a ton of shows and further established this band's presence in the whole death metal, you know, just scene in general. Along the way, they actually got Lars Rosenberg to join as their official bassist since Ufe actually recorded the bass lines for Left Hand Path. He came for the band Carbonized, and before they hit the studio to do the follow up. They had a personal spat between the rest of the band and LG, and LG was actually fired. Now, Nick would actually take over doing the vocals on the album, and they would actually get Johnny Dordevic from Carnage, which Shred and I did review their lone album, to do the live vocals. LG would join the band Comic-Con for one album, and while they might have been slightly fractured here, they went back to Skogsburg once again at Sunlight Studios, and on November 12th, 1991, or if you're in the U.S., it was February 11th, 1992, they released Clandestine, or what Cladenstein. else? Clandestine. That's like a horse or a bear. I don't know which. Dr. Clandestine. <laughs> <laughs> Takes your temperature rectally. The way I like it. This is my number two album. It's a little bit different than Left Hand Path, but still very similar. Like, it's a little bit more groove-oriented. I think the production, they made the guitars even heavier, if that was possible, if they did. Nick does a pretty good job on vocals, though. I do like LG's delivery a little bit more. And I would just say it's a worthy sophomore album. I love the artwork, especially on this one, too. I mean, Dan Seagrave does incredible artwork, but not quite as good as Left Hand Path, but few albums are. Sinners Bleed, Living Dead, Chaos Breed, there is a galloping chug in there that will just melt your fucking face. Awesome album. It's not as good as Left Hand Path, and it's not as good as my number two, but it's number three. Good songs, better production, good job, keep going that way, but we'll find out if they did or not later. <laughs> I don't. I uh, as my number three as well. It sticks with the Left Hand Path vibe, kind of. Um, this has got a little bit more thrash influence in it. Songs like Sinner's Bleed, that's got a great guitar and drum performance on it. Vocals start to get a little hokey. I'm gonna get into that. Seems to have a, a slight bit more groove, but yeah, it's my number three. More melody, more atmosphere. Let's, let's say it, slightly more accessible. Than, than the previous album, a little bit more by adding those melodies. I feel like uh, it makes it slightly more accessible and not that that's a bad thing at all, but damn strong, number two for me as well. While I don't think the songs themselves hit as hard as Left Hand Path, everything else about it to me was a slight improvement on it. And so it's such a strong album on its own. It, it deserves to be number two. I, you know, ah. Uh, We'll talk about it. <laughs> but, I mean, stay tuned. It was so cool, and then it's like 180. I don't know what's going on here. So LG and the band actually met in fences, and he returned to the band in 1992, and they pretty much began work on their third album, which would be a lot different than their previous two. They wanted to experiment, and that definitely shows in this album. They want to incorporate different elements punk rock, kind of straight up hard rock riffs and groove metal. And um, well, the results are very interesting and kind of divisive. So on October 4th, 1993, they released Wolverine Blues. 
This is my number five album. This is actually the first time I ever heard the band. I didn't see them on Headbangers Ball, but I did see them on Beavis and Butthead, and it was the Wolverine Blues video, which doesn't really have anything to do with Wolverine. Eric just kind of sandwiched him in there. It's like, well, it's the Americans like him. And it's wildly different. Again, rock riffs. It still has the HM2 tone, but it's kind of thinned out and... Oh. Very thin. It's uh, definitely more accessible. I like a lot of these songs though. I Master, I love the opener, is fucking amazing. Demon, full of hell, out of hand. These are like really interesting songs that, I don't know, they kind of don't belong anywhere. Like this is kind of the birth of death and roll and that's kind of a very small genre. And well, I mean, it has kind of mixed results, but overall I think they kind of laid down the formula for it here and it's a really solid album. This is my number two. I actually really like this record. The vocals instantly remind me of like Lemmy meets early Rob Flynn. They play a little bit more in the thrash department here. Um, it reminds me of like hardcore at times. Definitely. Definitely death and roll. Just comes out swinging with a D beat. I found a lot of hooks in here. The groove and Wolverine blues in the title track alone reminds me of Helmets in the Meantime. Yeah, it sounds like Slayer at times. Like it's it's just all over the map and I, I really kind of like that about this record. So number two. It is also my number two, my first experience with them. Uh, I was a very young teenager and I loved comic books. I said, yeah. Later, doesn't have anything to do with Wolverine, but hey, <laughs> I bought it on cassette, so <laughs> yay. It was when I was trying to figure out my heavy metal identity, Groove, Pantera, White Zombie, Sepultura, and for some reason, Entombed just got lost, because then I found Fear Factory and Machine Head. And, but this is my first experience with them, and I love this album because it makes me feel like a kid. This was pre-23 written. Yeah, I was... Uh, he was 22 and a half. 22 and a half. But now that I'm 23, I know a lot more about them. It's going to fall. Where did my Entombed go? My sweetest friend. <laughs> Every death metal band I know goes away. Oh, here end. comes the betrayal. The Betrayal was not that bad. I enjoy the album Wolverine Blues as an album of music, but in, in Tombs names on it, so it's kind of weird. And However, it doesn't become weird as we continue on with the discography, but this whole trend of you know the more sludgy stuff, and I mean, it, Wolverine Blues is still extreme. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, it's still extreme, yeah. but it has you know more of the sludgy, rocky kind of vibe. I mean, it could have been a COC album, like we were talking about. Yeah. And that's a little weird for me because they just put out Left Hand Path and I'm like totally just created one genre and then said, no, nah, fuck that. We're out. Peace. It's a little confusing, but is the album good as a whole? Absolutely. I'll say number seven. Again, this one was very divisive with fans. Surprisingly, the reviewers actually really seem to enjoy this one. But yeah, they forged ahead in one genre and then... Uh, forged ahead in another little subgenre. They like doing shit differently. Now, despite this album being very divisive, it was actually one of their most successful. They actually managed to score a distribution deal with Columbia Records and then even threw Wolverine on the cover of some of the editions of the CD, even though the band was like, it's not about him. It's okay. I bought it. I mean, I, I actually did see that edition, but I went with the regular one. Now, in 1995, Lars Rosenberg would exit the band. He would be replaced by Jorgen Sandstrom, ex-grave bassist on bass. Now, again, despite this album being very successful, they chose to leave Earache Records, which, well, I mean, maybe they had some foresight there because Earache kind of shit on a lot of bands, but they kind of went around shopping for labels. They even tried East West since Pantera had actually, you know, kind of latched onto that label and had some success. They had an album ready to go, but they were still turned down. Now, they ended up just forming their own imprint, Three Man Records, and then got a distribution deal through larger labels, namely Music for Nations. So, they got back to the studio, and this album would move even further, kind of more towards the uh, death and roll sound. Actually, maybe minus a uh, fair amount of death. Fair. It barely no. rolls. On October 28th, 1997, they released, well, we'll just say the Roman numeral, DCLXVI, which is 666 in Roman numerals. That's clever, but it's also known as to ride, shoot straight, and speak the truth. This is my number 10. I like individual tracks in here, but as a whole, 
It's just kind of an uneven album. The production is obnoxious. Like, it's just loud. They put so much sizzle on those guitars, it, it's almost kind of painful sometimes. The title track, Damn Deal Done, which is, like, I don't know, like kind of like a punky crowbar song. I really like that, but this just feels like it's kind of goofy. Like, even like the sinister nature, like, oh, we're dangerous death metal bands. Like, no, you guys are kind of just dicking around. I don't know. Like, I, I feel like this is kind of like a loss of identity there, and they were really just trying to push mm -hmm. really hard, trying to replicate Wolverine Blues. But um, I don't know. You just get this uneven album that's maybe more humorous and I mean, it has some decent songs. But overall, yeah, landed number 10 for me. It's my number nine. This sounds like a, a watered down version of the album prior. Yeah. It's strange. First of all, the production, I think, is just... I think it's butt the whole way through. The vocals, though, kind of remind me of Lynn Strait. If anything, the album as a whole is kind of like a less heavier snot. Somewhat peculiar, sounds more like a, a gruff Danzig. It's weird, and I don't really like it. <laughs> LG can carry there, a tune, but I prefer him growling. There, right, it, it's just weird, and it, it definitely was not up on the list for me. I have it at number seven, kind of middle of the road. But uh, things that he just said I didn't really think about, so maybe that's why it's high on my list, because I like Snot, I like Danzig. <laughs> maybe that's why I like the groovy Wolverine Blues stuff. It, this is more like it, not as good, but uh, that's probably why it's in the middle-ish. It, it screams of like a very like mid-90s metal album. Yeah, and I'm, that's when I was not 23. This is number 11 for me. When did Jerry Garcia come back from the dead and decide <laughs> to start a jam band of metal? Like, this stoner vibe... Was he dead by then? Yeah, he was dead oh, by then. Oh, he was dead okay, by then. Yeah. Gratefully. Yeah, yeah. gratefully. Oh. He was entombed. <laughs> <laughs> it all connects. <laughs> Regardless of his enclosure or not, this album is really just a lot of filler to me, and I did not find many things redeeming about it. I did not think that it could get much worse as far <laughs> as this discography went until I listened to the next album. Now, despite uh, To Ride, Shoot Straight, Speak the Truth actually having, you know, kind of a mixed reaction from the fans, it was <laughs> reviewed really well. In fact, it actually finished second in Metal Hammer's Best of 97 poll. Now, this marks one of the first major departures in terms of band members. Nick exits the band and he wanted to continue focusing on his rock band, The Helicopters, which they're awesome and distinctly not metal. Now, the problem was he was actually the main songwriter for a long time. He actually pretty much composed all that wonderful shit that we heard in the first three albums and, uh, well, maybe a little bit on the fourth. So Peter Stjernvin, I'm sorry if I'm butchering <laughs> your name, uh, formerly of Merciless, joins as their new drummer. Now, for this album, they did actually tour heavily in the U.S., actually for the first time since 91. And when they went back to record their uh, new album, well, they did not go to Thomas Cogsberg. They went to one Daniel Ray, who actually had worked with Ramones and White Zombie to produce this new album. Now, Uffe Sitterlin would become the main songwriter on this one, so I guess a lot of this album goes to him for the blame. Oof. Oof. Oof, yeah. So on November 16th, 1998, they what the fucked their entire fan base. <laughs> the same difference. But it was different. It, it was, was it much different. It wasn't the same. There's it, nothing, not there's same. nothing it, entombed about this album. No. Maybe LG's vocals. That's it. This, <laughs> this is dead last. For me, it's dead it, last. Yeah. Yep. There yeah. were a yeah. lot of people that asked me why I didn't bring up this album in terms of the video I did about 10 terrible albums that aren't St. Anger. And this is why, because I get a shit on it here. This was their alternative rock gamble, and that's, holy that's shit. That's what I said. It's like it's the bad. It's like the crap that was on 89X, one of the former local radio stations here, right before they went out. Oh, it was, God. Like, I thought this was like bad. late 90s version of butt rock. Like, all right, late 90s were not a great time to be a metal band, especially a death metal band. And Ew. yeah, you, you, were, you were kind of forced to adapt to a change in culture, and they didn't do it so well. No. But they did not have a DJ. They didn't have a DJ. Kudos to them. Yes. Yep. It doesn't, maybe the DJ would have made it better, though. 
I'm already out of nice things to say about this album. The supreme good should be the supreme bad. Uh, let's see. What you need is uh, punky and okayish for a terrible album. Uh, the s title track says Southern Sludge. Not great. Uh, what's my favorite track? Oh, yeah. No, turning it off and putting on literally anything else. This is a terrible album, and even the band didn't like it. So, yeah, that, that definitely says a lot about this. There's a couple of bits here and there that I don't mind, but then it it get, gets ruined. Yeah. See, now I thought Clauses had some decent moments in it. The, these guys wrote the, left hand path. Stop. I, no. I understand. No, stop. Yeah, no, these no, guys wrote no, left hand path. And put the, but stop. I, I understand. How, how many people from left hand path are still in the band at this point? Uh, both guitarists. Okay, and there's the no excuse then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah. bullshit. Yeah. I mean, I think they will local H some money. Yeah, dude. Like this was, <laughs> was like watered down diet helmet. I, I, diet clutch. Yeah. It's and the fun. and the vocals are pretty yeah. bad. And it's pretty bad. Yeah. Well, LG sticks out like a sore thumb. Like we're doing alternative rock. Like ah, oh, I don't. I, I. You've heard me. Yeah. That's, this isn't gonna work. Pretty bad. Uh, we, uh, what's the worst that could happen? Our entire fan base goes, "What the fuck have you done?" And that's happens. what happens. Sometimes you, you, you try, and it doesn't, doesn't yeah. work out. So aluminum much. anus. This is their aluminum anus. It really is. This is your shit pipe, bub. Your shit pipe. They did not do an album with Lou Reed. No. God, could Lou Reed have made this better or worse? I don't know. Should have got a DJ. So, pretty much the whole period after this album was a lot of, well, that didn't work. Still, they managed to tour and they landed a really cool tour with Meshuggah and Skin Lab, and I imagine they didn't play much off of Same Difference on that mm. tour. Mm. Now, to essentially kind of uh, save the fans, they put out an EP of covers called Bad Juju in 99, and that pretty much bought them enough time to get back to the studio and right a lot of wrongs. <laughs> the next album, they wanted to be raw and heavy. They wanted this album to deliberately sound grittier than hell. And, well, I think it they it, 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 they definitely did. They tapped one Nico Elgstrand, who actually assisted on the production on Bad Juju to produce it, and they produced it with the band as well. So everyone kind of got in there and made this thing the big, dirty, nasty album that it is. This thing was recorded and mixed in 18 days. March 6, 2000, they unleashed Uprising. This is my number three. This is death and roll done fucking right. Mm -hmm. I actually thought Wolverine Blues would actually beat this one out, but going back, I just connect with this album more. The dirty sounding production is fucking perfect for Entombed. This is Muddy, riffy, and a fuck ton of fun to listen mm -hmm. to. There is a little bit of death metal left on it. Something Out of Nothing has an awesome triplet chug little death metal section, but songs like Say It and Slugs, mm -hmm. oh, what a riff. That thing could cave in heads. And then In the Flesh is the, probably the doomiest thing they've ever written. This album is fucking wonderful, and I would say pretty much underrated in their entire discography because it kind of does get looked over. But yeah, number three for me. I had number five. I think this record is really, really good. It was really rough ranking after number three. This is like if Motorhead and Early Mastodon and Life Once Lost made a record with COC. Songs like Say It in Slugs, Won't Back Down. Won't Back Down is a really fun jam. Insanity is Contagious. Just caught a, a bunch of really gritty, awesome tone out of this record. A lot of bands that I really enjoy, it just sounded like that. And it was fun, and I like it. Crust Punk and DB. Let's yep. do it. Yep. Yep. Also number five, uh, maybe they got that experimental thing. You gotta get your experimentation out and then figure out, oh yeah, people liked Left Hand Path. Let's maybe not redo it, but remember where it came from and stock home it up a little bit. Turn that fuzz. That's what we want out of Entombed. Number five. I have this at number nine. While I appreciate ditching the whole alternative metal vibe and getting more aggressive, this still is basically like Wolverine Blues 2.0. And while I, while I enjoy it, this definitely kind of falls in the middle for me due to that reason. 
Entombed is at their best for my ears when they are doing metal. And while this is a solid album, this still isn't the same band to me that did Left Hand Path. And for those reasons, I have to cast thee at number nine. <laughs> so Uprising actually got both critical acclaim from fans and reviewers alike, and they actually managed to land an opening slot, a very coveted opening slot with Iron Maiden in Europe and Canada. Now, they loved the results so much from Uprising, they actually went back to Nico to do the follow-up, and there's something to be said for Momentum, because they were back in the studio pretty much in 2000. So on March 3rd, 2001, they released Morningstar. This is my number four album. I love this album, I think the production, they kind of stripped away a little bit of the mud, but it still sounds grittier than hell. A little bit more thrash influence. Mm -hmm. This album is just heavy as nuts. The HM2 is back on full display, especially when you listen to songs like Year One Now. That is yeah. maybe, maybe two minutes, but it is a brutal two minutes, and my God, it just stomps your fucking face yeah. in. Eye for an eye. Big Slayer riffs all throughout there. About to die. Probably one of my favorite fast, thrashy tracks from Entombed in general. This album just fucking whoops ass. There's some interesting little nods to um, the opening track, Chief Rebel Angel, actually includes a lot of lines from The Devil's Advocate, which I guess the band are mm. uh, giant fans. Yeah, all of Al Pacino's lines. Yeah. Good, yeah. Good movie. But yeah, this is an absolutely killer album. It fell behind Uprising just because I think this is. Uh, not as uniform as Uprising. There's a lot of experimentation. Like, all the songs, I think, on this album are really different. So you get this kind of odd listen. But it's a fun one. So, yeah, number four. Finally, The Rock has come back to heavy metal. This is my number three. About damn time. This is what I wanted. I wanted I wanted the metal to come back. Uh, thrash, yes, please. Uh, the track Year One Now and About to Die with that thrash influence really kind of propel the excitement for me. I am finally back into loving some Entombed at the moment because that whole blues rock experimentation stuff was not for me at all. So this was number three. This is one of the best bangers to me since Left Hand Path and Cladenstein. Mm. Still a bear or a horse. Clandestine. <laughs> and yeah, I'm glad they came back with a ripper on this, man. I love this album. It's really good. You should check it out. Number four, what everyone said. <laughs> yeah. Up the tempo, up the fuzz, the clean balls. up some stuff. Yeah, balls are back. Oh, yes. God. Balls are back. What I said about Uprising, they, oh, yeah, they like that kind of stuff. Okay, let's do that. And maybe we like it, too. Attitude. So, yep, attitude, balls, momentum. Balls, a lot of balls. Balls <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> balls to the wall, man. Oh. I think you're really honing in on the balls. I, <laughs> I also had this at number four. This is a killer album. Immediately, just get reminded of Slayer. Just right off the bat. It's thrashy. It's a, it gets even darker. It kind of is the next best thing next to Left Hand Path as far as tone is concerned. Oh, dude. I think. Ensemble of the Restless, I think, might be one of my favorite Entomb tracks of all time. Like, that's pretty solid. Tons of hooks, tons of groove. Vocals are are, are better, oh, yeah. I, I think, in here. He they, sounds like he's really just projecting the shit yeah, out Yeah, just it. belting it out. I will say Mental Twin, in in my opinion, could have been a beast height on Same Difference. It's an odd song. That's just what I'm going to say. I think but Young Man Nihilist is kind of odd, too. But eh. Yeah, but overall, this is a really solid record. So naturally, because they're entombed, they tore their dicks off and even did a special one-off performance at the Royal Swedish Opera with the Royal Ballet Ensemble in 2002, and then that was later released as their Unreal Estate live album. It's uh, very strange. And also during this period, of course, they were working on new material. Now this time, they actually tapped uh, Pell Wigwam, that's his uh, nickname, uh, Gunnerfelt to produce this new album. Ah, uh, yes. How and, many umlauts? Uh, I don't know. They didn't type them in there. Oh. But he also worked with the band on this one, and on August 3rd, 2003, they released Inferno. This is my number nine. This album's odd. First off, uh, Wigwam didn't do a great job mixing this. Oh my god, no. This is a very muddy album, <laughs> and it's not like the cool muddy that Uprising was. 
it's just like it sounds like it's poorly mixed. The songs are kind of all over the place. You kind of got again that death and roll vibe. You got some punkier tracks, some slow, doomy, groovy tracks, especially uh, "Children of the Underworld" and the opening track "Retaliation," which I do think is a banger. But it musically kind of sits in between "Uprising" and "Morning Star." But honestly. It just kind of feels odd, like especially the weird lyrics make an appearance. Oh my god, dude. <laughs> flexing muscles, <laughs> jerking off as a flexing. No, I don't. I don't want to know about your experiences at the gym. Uh, no, it, it's just a strange album. It has some good tracks, but yeah, um, I'm not the biggest fan of it. But uh, they definitely did worse. So yeah, number nine. This is my number eleven. Not. Not a fan. Uh, first of all, the bass tone on here is absolutely horrid. <laughs> it, it, it's gone. It sounds like they put pillows over the, the guitar cabs and then recorded. Wet mattresses. Yeah, yeah, like, like, and then put the mic, like, directly against the pillow. I think they lost steam coming out of Morningstar. Maybe they were just, I don't know what they were feeling, but it wasn't this record. The songs start off with decent potential, but then they all kind of melt into one another as far as the overall structure and same feel to it and the lyrics what the hell yeah dumb as fucking fuck um no but no but daddy no no but daddy i'm not giving daddy a kiss it's not happening it's different when you can understand the lyrics and yeah i, I definitely run into issues with that later on here like the lyrics to that's when i become a satanist those are fucking dumb. <laughs> <laughs> those are, I, I think those are kind of endearingly it's, dumb. Like, it's, it's, it's fine, right, 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 right. You're just like, oh, but, nah. Yeah, I got it at number nine. I think maybe that's why I like it a little more than some other ones. Yeah. The lyrics are different. Not nearly as good as the last few albums, two albums. But, um, yeah, it's giggle and jam a little. There's some jams on there. Yeah. Yeah, just giggle. No, jam. no, no. <laughs> What the fuck happened? <laughs> what happened? Were we you were scolding them? We were doing so well. They got into that tussing again. You were doing so well, and then you shit the bed. <laughs> this is my number 10. There's really not that many uh, songs on here that I get into. I was more than disappointed, as I'm sure you all can tell by my speech, that, you know, the death metal just kind of started to trail off again, and, and that made me a little bit nervous. So He's not mad. He's just disappointed. Yeah, yeah. It definitely sits on the bottom half with Same Difference and DCLXVI. Now, as always, of course, a lot of touring ensued, and actually would come some major lineup changes. Jorgen Sandstrom actually left the band and was replaced by Nico Elkstrand, who actually did their production and was already super familiar with them. Ufa Sederlin, longtime you know, original member, actually left, and he was actually the main songwriter for this period. Departed in 2005, which left Alex Hedlund to pretty much take over all guitars. So during this time, they inked a deal with Candlelight Records and released an EP called When in Sodom. And actually, that kind of got me hyped because that EP actually sounded like old and tuned. Like they were trying to get back to that left hand path sort of sound again. Now, after that EP dropped, Peter Stjernvin, I'm sorry again, bless you, left the band and was replaced by Ola Dahlstedt. And on June 25th, 2007, they released Serpent Saints. This is my number 11. I feel like I should like this album, but I don't. It seemed like a real attempt to get back to the old school and tomb sound. Uh, the, the riffs were raw, it was gritty and dirty, but it just comes off like a really stupid version of Left Hand Path. Like Fair. the Danny DeVito twin. Uh. <laughs> it's it's just the leftover crap. I. I don't know how else to explain this. Like, it's just dumb. Especially when you get down to lyrics again. The whole, you want to bite my cock on a muck? No, we don't. <laughs> nope. I don't even know. Like, like, he was just looking for stuff to rhyme on this. There are some good songs on there, like Masters of Death, uh, Warfare, Plague, Famine, Death, and Thy Kingdom Coma. That's probably the lone clever moment is that title, but it just sounds sloppy and directionless. And again, I was super hyped about this because the EP was actually really good. And then, well, yeah, this this is not a great album, but you know, what can you do? It's my number 10. Here's what I feel about this album. I think that the band was confused on what direction this album should go. 
Because I think a lot of the songs sound mismatched more than anything. Yeah. They didn't take the left-hand path. No. When in Sodom is a ripper until the choir comes in with the stupid chorus. In the Blood opens heavy, but it's where I think it starts to derail a little bit. The mix was improved a little bit. A little bit. Very and, depressed. But I, I, I think even from song to song, I think the mix changed a little bit. It was another strange one. Yeah. And the kind of Rob Zombie meets Max Cavalera on the vocals. It just, it, I, I just think it, it was, it was man, it was not, it was man. Yeah, that's where I'm kind of at. Number 11, sounds good, but yeah, meh. Uh, songs are there. If you like songs, there's some on here. Yeah. Yeah. Not near, not, not, it's not same difference. It's, no, no, it's, it's a not. different same difference. The intent was there. The yeah. intent and the the want to get back to that old there, sound there was the, there. Yeah, it's, it's honest. It's just a honest man. Like you, you threw the ball hard down the lane, but it bounced and skipped over and hit someone else's lane of the bowling alley. That's that's pretty much it. A pin cut. I've been there. I've yeah. been there. I couldn't disagree more. Oh, boy. <laughs> this is go. number six for me. Oh, my. Uh, it is my least favorite of the original Entomb's actual metal albums. But I still enjoy it a lot more than the the whole, you know, stoner rock, blues rock kind of era of this band. Songs like When in Sodom are pretty nasty, even with the choir chorus. Uh, Masters of Death and In the Blood are huge standouts to me. Yeah, it might seem a little bit uh, all over the place, but they've had some all over the place albums in the past and, and it's been okay. Still, I enjoy this more than the whole stoner groove you know, because to me, I would rather hear other bands do that. So I just didn't particularly care for that brand. So maybe that's why it's pushed a little bit higher to me than you guys, because you guys are a little bit more, uh, less picky, I would say, when it comes to that stuff. So number six for me. So now we get to the AD part. But before that, we had a member added. Uh, Victor Brandt actually joined on bass. He came from Aeon, and then Nico actually moved to guitars. So, in 2013, that started a legal battle between Alex Hellid and LG Petrov in terms of the name Entombed. Now, Alex would actually win the actual name Entombed, but during this time, LG had actually brokered a deal with Century Media Records for new Entombed albums. So, essentially, LG was forced to change the name to Entombed AD. Now, I think the main reason Alex won was because Ufe Sutherland and Nick Anderson were actually going to be part of another version of Entombed, and that pretty much made the whole court case drag out pretty long, and well, I mean, courtrooms are so much fun. Just ask Fear Factory. They've been in one for the last two and a half years. Good times. So, of course, as a result, LG, Nico, Ola, and Victor became Entombed AD officially in 2014. So after the band gets its brand new, well, kind of new moniker, they released their uh, debut album, I guess, as Entombed AD, on August 5th, 2014, and that was Back to the Front. This is number seven for me. I like this. This is a pretty solid album. It's kind of a little bit more towards the death metal side. I think pretty much everything they fucked up on Serpent Saints, they kind of got right here, minus the production. Um, I don't like the guitar tone on this. It, it doesn't feel very entombed -y. It's It's kind of, I'm not really even like sludge, it just feels just kind of too warm and friendly for death metal. Kind of reminds me of the first Byzantine album. Little bit, little bit. It's, it's odd, but I like the songs, especially Bait and Bleed, which, uh, you're doing it wrong. Soldier of No Fortune, especially, I think that song is absolutely killer. I think the songwriting on this is so much better too. Like, I just feel like they kind of got this thing together and this was kind of a good launching point for the new brand, essentially. And I like the fact that there are some heavy, like death metal songs again, that actually just scream death metal, like Waiting for Death and Second to None. Yes. Pretty solid album. I mean, you know, they had a lot of competition to get further up there on the list for me, but this is a good album. I also had it number seven. I thought there was more heft to the recording again. I really like the punchy drums, dude. That snare is fat. 
with a PH. Although I dig the production and the groove, I think this record only has a couple standout tracks. Waiting for Death, obviously, Eternal Woe, yeah. um, and Digitus Medius. That song has a punch. Do me. But yeah, it's number seven. It's a, a good offering after some of the... Uh, a little uneven period Some there. of the, the, the bombs on... Uh, Sorry, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> it is what it is. It. Um, I have it at number 10. Not sure why. They got a few albums, so it had to be somewhere. Uh, the production is better, but eh, the, the songs aren't that noteworthy. They're good songs, but it's like, yeah, there's other songs. I can only hold so many songs. No, I just lost one. <laughs> oh, See what you guys did? <laughs> Jeez. You'll get it back, buddy. Don't I think it was an Eve it. 6 song. No, that's probably from the last time. No, yeah, let, let it go. go. This is my number eight. This has some interesting moments. It's cool to hear some of the experimentation as far as with the instrumentation, some of the lighter stuff and sound effects, you know, more prevalent here than they have been on previous albums. But all in all, it wasn't as strong as their initial debut as Entombed. Uh, not much can be. I do find that out of all three of Entombed AD's albums this is my least favorite but i still think this is pretty solid and along the same terms as maybe some of the uprising wolverine blues kind of stuff so yep. there's definitely a bit of death and roll still on this one but i think that kind of contributes to the whole groove thing and you know coming out of the legal battle with well kind of a new lineup i don't know i think they did a pretty good job so pretty much they just got right back to work after you know the long legal battle debut album, which I believe was shelved anyway, just because, well, uh, Legal Battle. And actually, I remember seeing the ads for Back to the Front with the Entombed logo on it, and then the next time I saw the ads for it, I was like, that says something different. <laughs> <laughs> so, Psych. they pretty much just got right back to work, and the follow-up would actually end up having a lot of producers, like, more than I actually wanted to list, but I didn't want to include Nico because he did contribute on production again. And they continue to push the new AD brand on February 26, 2016 with Dead Dawn. This is my number six album. This album whoops ass. All the energy, I would say, is back. The songs are heavy. The HM2 tone is pretty much back there. It's, like, it's still a little fuzzy and warm, but there's a crispiness to it. And I think the songs are overall just more intense and more heavy. Down to Mars to Ride, that is just such a whoop-ass song. Not what it seems. Midas in reverse. This is just a nasty banger of an album, and kind of close to those early years again with Entombed. So this is kind of almost a full circle sort of album, but there's still a little bit of that death and roll groove to it, but I think this was more focused on just being a death metal album, and they killed it. This was the only time I ever got to see Entombed AD. They were on tour with Amon Amarth, and... LG was probably one of the smiliest frontmen I've ever seen in a death metal band. He was just up there having a good time, and I bought this album not too long after seeing him, and holy shit, it's killer. In the words of Wesley Willis, this album whoops a horse's ass with a bell. Hmm. The punches are coming, and they don't stop, son. This album is my number four, and easily, well, I shouldn't say easily, but it is my favorite of the Entombed AD small discography. This album is definitely a revert back to the first couple albums and their veins of musicality that are entrenched in more evil and darkness. And that's that's what we're all about here at Thralls of Metal, is, is the evil and the darkness. So, darkness. this album is filled with excellent guitar work, great songs, and just aggressiveness that doesn't show up on some of their other discographies. This is a gem to me. Number four. Number six, um, it's a banger. Um, I just have, you know, five other ones above this one. <laughs> um, the hunger, little spurts of hunger and balls. Little spurts of balls. And we hunger for the balls around here. And You're that's the lottery hunger for, for the balls. balls. And they're nice and marinated and tender. So butt life has changed to ball life? We're ball famished. Butt ball life. Dead by dawn. Dead dong. Dead Dawn. I had this at number eight. I'm not gonna say that the songs were bad on this album because they weren't. I thought it had like a kind of a Baroness feel to it at times. Yep, yep, I, that's what I heard. A Baroness feel but more rock. Um, 
Dead Dawn reminds me of a, a like a Black Label Society track on the verse. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are chuggy grooves. There was some thrash again. The, the lead work was really cool. Here was my thing. For me, at least, the songs had the same tempo for the most part, and subsequently the same groove, like throughout the record. And I'm that trying was, to see what you're saying. And that was a I, takeaway. I, he lost me on Baroness. Uh, he, <laughs> I, I, that's a hard right. I, yeah, I'm. I disagree. I disagree. That's what I heard. What do you guys think? Tell us in the comments below if you agree or disagree. Yeah, feel free to uh, comment. I'm sure you will. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm commenting in my head right now. It's altars all over again, man. <laughs> it always comes back to that. Dude, Woo! dude, it came out when we were talking to him in force. Yeah, dude. It was like, yeah, wait, didn't you have, like, altars? Are like, no, dude, they called him on it. It was like, that's just, really? The lead singer agreed with me. <sighs> he was being nice. He was being nice. <laughs> <laughs> So in 2018, Victor Brandt exits the band, though he continued on with LG's other project, Firespawn, which eventually we definitely want to cover that because that was a kick-ass three album run they had. But during this run, their second guitarist who actually played live with them officially joined the band, Gilherm Miranda. And he'd been playing with the band since 2015, so he officially joined in 2019. So they needed a bassist and they got one Putz Weck. That is his real name. Putz Weck. P U T Z, then Weck. Yeah, Putz. Oh, yeah. He joined as a session bassist and he had a strange name. Good and for him. yeah. Good for him. They pretty much got the same ensemble of producers again that they had on Dead Dawn because they liked the overall feel of the album, as well as Nico, too. And on August 30th, 2019, they released Bowels of Earth. I actually reviewed this one. Uh, on my own, you know, when it came out, and I was super excited to hear it, and this is my number eight. Not because I think it's a bad album, it's just, you know, you had a lot of good albums ahead of it. This is another solid offering, and I think, again, kind of pushed more towards the death metal side. This album felt a little bit more fun and loose, especially, you know, Hell is My Home, Bourbon Nightmare, holy shit, that song's I love the whole yeah. accordion thing in the beginning of that. It's great. <laughs> like, it's, it's just a fun, goofy album. Their cover of Hank Williams' I'll Never Get Out of This World <laughs> Alive, it's awesome. There's sort of a, like a Motorhead-like spirit to this. There's like a Lemmy vibe on even some of the tracks. And honestly, the first three tracks on this album just scream early and tuned. This is a flat-out fun album, and, well, sadly it'd be the last one, but they left off on a killer point. It is number eight, but again, a lot of competition. Still a great album. I also have it number eight. Yep, they were having a good time and I guess if you gotta leave, leave on a good time. And no. Cause, yeah. Who knows if they would have experimented more and have another same difference or another clandestine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a horse, right? Or a yes. <laughs> a, a horse. But we'll never know. But we have 12 albums of... That's a face that LG made a lot. Yes. <laughs> With more hair over his face. There, you, there you go. There it is. <laughs> I this at number six. To me, it was like a thrashier left-hand path. The intensity is brought back. It sounds like they were kind of rejuvenated at this point, and they wanted to go all out and make a pretty killer, really fun record. Great leads in Torment Remains. Um, the blast beats in Elimination I thought was cool because you don't hear blast beats hardly at all throughout yeah. Entombed. That's a fun music video. Lots of drinking. Yep. Hooks all over the place. Rift City, as far as I was concerned. Through the Eyes of the Gods. Uh, to Eternal Night. Almost Doomy. I think at times, so I would agree. Yeah, it was a it was a fun record actually. I really enjoyed it, and again, you know, what a way to keep going. This is my number five. I like this album a lot. I found that those touches of doom and just the inflation of balls, if you will, the yeah. nonstop inflation of balls, really made this stand out to me. It is not as good, in my opinion, as Dead Dawn but I think it is a hell of a way to leave off this discography because it's about as cool as you can do it, right? If the choice is a really badass, aggressive, heavy album or something like Same Difference, what would you want to leave off on? I definitely would want to leave off on Bowels of Earth. This was 
throwback to showing the people that every once in a while they play a heavy metal band on TV. <laughs> they will have long hair, they will wear black shirts. <laughs> so, as we said, this would end up being Entombed AD's final album. And there's a horrible, sad reason for it. Sadly, 2021, March 7th, we lost LG Petrov. He had a long battle with bile duct cancer. He made that public in August of 2020, and he seemed like he had a really positive outlook on it. He was even sharing pictures in the hospital saying, hey, gonna keep fighting. I and that. Yep. yeah, it sadly took him. And honestly, he, just going through this again, like he is one of my favorite death metal from them. There was just something fun about him. Like he was kind of like one of those like, you know, metal spirit animals. He's out there revving up the crowd. He was joking with the crowd when I saw him. Dude, someone gave him a beer and he drank it on stage. Like, hey, thanks, man. <laughs> and, you know, he was just, you know, kind of this awesome spirit and he is solely missed. Now, there is another version of Entombed though, which, I don't know, it's interesting. They do have a lineup. They did do a live performance of Clandestine not too long ago and released it. And I've heard rumors that they would possibly record under the Entombed banner but that remains to be seen. So in terms of Entomb's future, it's kind of up in the air, but the past they have is fucking awesome. What a wild band that really wasn't afraid to experiment. Sometimes a little bit of that fear should have crept in there and told them not to do yeah, it. Maybe don't hit record. Yeah, hmm. yeah. All like, the time. there was a lot of difference. It wasn't the same. I think they had the dark throat mentality of they were gonna do what they wanted when they wanted and they didn't give a shit. And for that, I respect them very much so. Just because it didn't resonate with me that well all the time, right. but yeah. they did it their way, and what a better way to do it. And that's awesome. They're, they're pioneers. They, they started a whole subset of death metal, brought forth quite possibly my favorite guitar tone in death metal, and then yeah. kind of cast it aside to do their own thing. And honestly, I think death and roll kind of really starts with them, too. Just an awesome band. A lot of this is my first experience with Entombed outside of Left Hand Path. I've heard songs, I'm sure, from these other records, I'm sure of it. But, you know, as far as listening to the albums as a whole, this was my first time. So, I, I became a fan, <laughs> for sure. I, I know way more about Entombed than the, the albums I really like, I really fucking like, and I'm probably going to add to my regular, you know, jamming. It's a, a shame that we had to uh, experience the loss that we, we did this year. Uh, it's a shame that, you know, it won't continue in this branch of the legacy, so to speak. But, yeah, uh, you know, great band, good times. For some reason, Entombed was a band that always just escaped me. I, like I said, I had, I had Wolverine Blues as a young lass, and uh, for some reason never kept up with them, um, besides Left Hand Path, because... Because <laughs> that whoops ass. Yeah. And for some reason, I was like, oh, I got other albums, uh, Left Hand Paths over here. It's literally playing behind us right now. Right. right. So right. It, it, what it, perfect timing. This was on yeah. random, too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What a way to close the video. Yeah. This is a real table. <laughs> <laughs> They're a band that it's hard to absorb, minus the two albums I'm familiar with, all the other albums, and give a objective ranking, but uh, at least five of these albums are going to probably permanently yep. enter my yep. rotations. Yep. yep. There's other albums besides Left Hand Path. Who knew? I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm in the same yeah, boat, I mean, but yeah, I, I, I agree. And I, probably five of these albums are going to enter my playlist. And I think Stan Lee was a big fan. <laughs> well, never mind. Iron Man. <laughs> I, Iron Man. Yeah. So that brings us to a close. If you guys enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you are new to the channel, subscribe because we do stuff like this all the time. We are also on Patreon. If you'd like to help us out there, there will be a link down below. And we promise in 2022 to put more in the Patreon. Yeah, yeah we're going to eventually get down that. That's one of our New Year's resolutions. Yep, yep, yep. yep. We also do have t-shirts for sale, though I would say hold off because we're going to have a surprise for you here uh, relatively soon. Ugh. <laughs> and uh, we can't wait to unleash that. We will they're, have a They're new fucking cool. So, yeah. Yep. Stay tuned for that. We'll definitely do an announcement for that. And, well, to further close this, we also want to announce what our next rankings are going to be. Well, we decided we were actually going to pick some bands that we wanted to cover that actually you guys have brought up several times in the comments. And, well, uh, first off, 
I chose Carcass. I've been waiting <laughs> to choose Carcass until the new album came out. It finally came out this year, and that immediately was my number one pick to rank this discography. Carcass all the way. I am so fucking on board. My pick will be Exodus. I know a lot of you thrashers have been asking us to do that one, and, well, they dropped a new album, too. That's going to be fun. And uh, we're going to get thrashy. We're going to wreck shit and uh, listen to some Exodus. The way it should be. Uh, I've got one that's been a long time coming. I've been waiting for quite some time to do it, and I uh, figure there's no time like the present. I'm going to go with Mastodon. Mastodon, to me, kind of rebirthed my, my love of drumming, to be honest. The first time I heard Bron Daler, I was like, well... Dude, there you go. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've been waiting to do it. And now that we got a new record, or two of them, now's the time. Petra, Tempora, Pantera will be my pick. I'm intimately familiar with their catalog, and it's relatively short, but the best. I mean, in terms of one of the most meaningful bands of my young years. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know if I would be Absolutely. sitting at this table if no. not for Pantera. Yeah. No. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, Make I, all I, the jokes you want yeah, about it. Like, I see what you say about us, Pantera, <laughs> yeah. and memes, but I don't give a shit. I get it, but you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. I am not a felon. I am not a felon. None of us have had sex with a sibling, right? That is correct. Okay. Absolutely correct. Right. I just want to make sure. I, I, I didn't want to assume. And also, 2021 ended on a heartbreak, and I could not let this video close without a touching tribute to Rose Nyland herself, Miss Betty White. May she be up in heaven, having endless martinis and classy girl drinks with Lemmy and Jimi Hendrix. Have one with LG, too. Raise your glasses. Betty White, you sweet, sweet lady. Just fly high, Betty. Fly high. Stay golden. So with that, I'd like to thank you all once again for watching, and we will catch you later.